Good morning. <laughs> Hope everyone had a fun night in New York City. Um, so here we are in the New York Times building. And uh, when planning my talk this year, I thought what better thing to talk about than the New York Times Innovation Report. Who here is familiar with the New York Times Innovation Report? OK, about a third of you. Well, by the end of my presentation, hopefully, everyone will raise their hand. Um, so before I get into the Innovation Report, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the early 90s <laughs> when my friend David and I owned a business called the Bagel Times. And on Sunday mornings, we would deliver bagels and newspapers to people's houses. And um, I was amazed as a 12-year-old that people in Cincinnati, Ohio, wanted to get the New York Times in addition to the Cincinnati Inquirer. So we would actually order these papers wholesale, and I would get a big stack of New York Times on my doorstep. And then we would pick up the bagels and drop them off to people's houses. So the New York Times, I knew there was something special about it. And it's, it's always been the paper of record. Now, Flash forward 25 years to May 15th, 2014. BuzzFeed breaks the news of the New York Times internal report about their challenges with digital marketing went public. This was a internal report that was put together by eight reporters. So the publishers of the Times um, hired or assigned eight reporters to look internally about the challenges and externally about what was going on in the digital universe to understand where the Times was, and it's an astonishing look inside the cultural and logistical changes needed for an organization to evolve to digital. And by the end, they had a strong sense of the opportunities and the internal roadblocks they needed to thrive in a rapidly changing digital environment. And I would say, even though it's a few years old now, it's a key document of the digital age. And a lot of the um, slides that I'm going to show you are going to be quotes from the, the the report itself. So the New York Times knew they were awesome reporters. They knew they had the best journalism. But what they didn't have was the skills, the expertise, the infrastructure to internally put their message out there and communicate pe with people in a digital first world. So they talked about their competitors, and they were getting killed by like BuzzFeed and Vox and the Huffington Post. These were digital first organizations, and they were you know, a very much print first organization. And so when you think about the arts and all of our competitors, we're not just competing with the other arts organizations in our city. We're competing with Netflix. We're competing with Xbox. We're competing with the movies. We're competing with so much. And many of these organizations are digital first, right? They were evolved, and they, were, they grew up, and they grew out of the digital era. And they know how to communicate in a very digital first way. So, I admit it, at our house, we get the New York Times print edition. I don't think I've ever said that publicly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, actually, my boyfriend gets it, and he'll sit on the couch reading the paper, and I will sit next to him <laughs> reading the paper on my phone. Um, who here subscribes to the digital edition of the New York Times? Yeah. Who here subscribes to the print edition? OK, a few, about less than half. Um, but the report is a goldmine of lessons for arts organizations. And even though now it's a couple years old, there are so many lessons. In fact, I had to pare it down for the sake of this presentation. Um, you may have heard me say this before, and some of the presentations yesterday touched on it, but we are living through, in the last 15 years, the most dramatic change in how human beings communicate in all of human history, right? Which is an incredibly exciting time to be a marketer. But it's an incredibly challenging time, because the pace of innovation is so intense, you constantly feel like you're in a state of catching up. Um, and so to see a storied institution like the New York Times go through this change is so instructive, um, particularly because the New York Times is not too different from an arts organization in that it's run by a very different generation of people, right? This is an organization that has been here a, quite a long time, is run by this sort of conservative uh, board and leadership committee that is of a generation that is not necessarily of the digital age. So it's very similar to a lot of arts institutions in that way. 
And it's an organization that was very change resistant. You learn by, in this report, you read of the challenges to make change, and, and I'll address that later, and I know many of your boards and leadership is very, very change resistant. Change is freaking hard. Um, so for years at boot camp, I've stood up here and talked about the value of digital, how important it is to be digital. This is the first time I am not going to present you stats on that. I'm not going to say this is what you, you know, this is where the trends are, this is where the eyeballs are. I hope you know that. And I hope that, and I know that almost all of you are at least ankle deep right now in, in being digital. That's why you're here. Many organizations are knee deep, some are hip deep. I think we still have a while till we're all fully immersed in, you know, it's a reflection of the massive changes we're going through. So, um, I hope this presentation, and by looking at the times, what they went through, will instruct you and give you a lot of thought, things to think about as you go back to your organization. So there's four topics of learning I peeled out of this over 100-page report. One is about understanding user experience. Two is about focusing on audience development. Three is about becoming more social. And four is opening up to radical change. And within these four areas, there's 10 key takeaways. So the first, understanding user experience. Number one, the value of the homepage is decreasing. Who here has recently undergone a website redesign? Who here spent a lot of time on that website redesign talking about what's going to be on the homepage, right? Constant, every organization wants, wants to be represented, or every part of the organization wants to be represented. So when you look at the innovation report, that's from the Times, and um, you see over the years, the visits to their homepage was dramatically decreasing. In fact, only a third of readers made it to the homepage of the New York Times. And those who did visit were spending far less time on those pages, and key page views or page views were static, if not down. So the challenge with the Times is they were used to writing their articles, the journalists, and then submitting them and then moving on, right? There was no need to push them out there. There was no need to use social media. There was no need to get people to pay attention because they were the times. They published the thing, it went out, and, and they were done, and they moved on to the next thing. Um, that's not the case in a digital world. <clears throat> so when we're thinking about the value of the homepage, people aren't just coming there. And when we're doing website redesigns, we often think of the user experience as, oh, someone's just going to type in the URL of, of my website and start here. But in reality, this is where users are entering your site, right? People are deep linking much further into your website. I thought it was really interesting yesterday when he said the average uh, page views is 1.7, right? If people realize that Google is a much better way to find answers to their questions, so they're not digging around and going multiple pages, to, pages through your site to find what they're looking for. And so if we think about the home page and the home, your, you know, how people are coming to your site, they're coming from email, they're coming from social, they're coming from search. The majority of people, when you aggregate the production detail pages, are actually landing on your performance detail page. Those are the heavy lifters of your website. That is where people are mostly landing. And they're not, even almost you know, significantly less are going to the home page and even less are going to the performance detail page. So many people are never, ever making it to your homepage. So think about all of that investment you're putting in there in terms of the inspirational images, all of the promotions you're putting on there. People are not seeing it. This is the homepage of your organization. So thinking about how you look on Google, I think is a very valuable exercise. And Kathleen talked yesterday a lot about search engine marketing and the importance of it, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. But you see here, when I search modern dance shows, um, the majority of the page is taken up by paid ads. So if I'm not playing in that universe, I'm not even there. And then you have to think about how you're appearing on Google Places and how you're appearing in your organic search. These are very valid things to spend time thinking about. I pulled this up and I was thinking, you know, how can I find a really bad paid search ad? I know they're not here. Um, organic search ad, sorry. But like, that's not a very good introduction to the organization. That is an organization that definitely needs to spend some time thinking about their search engine optimization, which is how they look on the homepage of Google organically. So we worked with uh, Seattle Opera, and Christina's gonna come up here later today and talk about user testing. And one of the big takeaways in looking at their analytics was that graph I showed you where the majority of people were landing on their production detail pages. And this is their new production detail page, and it looks a lot like a home page. 
And that is by design. So that inspirational imagery is part of their production detail page. And as we look at this production detail page, um, you see the infusion of beautiful imagery, of cross promotion, ways to save. That's something you would put on your homepage, perhaps. And as you go down here, you see this beautiful multimedia. This, again, looks like that homepage scroller you see on many arts websites. So thinking that a user is going to start on this page and may not go beyond this page. They're never going to go to the homepage. So all of that information is here. And this cross promotion. So they may not be interested in Hansel and Gretel, but at least they have the opportunity now to see what else is going on this season, giving some place to go next rather than having hit back. If people are going back to your homepage, it's because there's something not going quite right on your website generally. Number two, make uh, mobile is a separate experience, right? Mobile is not a mini version of your desktop site. So the art or the time said, instead of running mobile on autopilot, we need to view the platform as an experience that demands its own quality control and creativity. So every year we do a digital marketing benchmark survey where we survey a bunch of you and arts marketers. This year we had over 130 organizations respond. Um, can I take this moment to please, 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 if you get that email next year, respond so we have more data like this. I think it's super valuable for the industry. Um, in 2014, we saw that about a third of organizations did not have a mobile or mobile-enabled website. And in 2015, the picture wasn't that much better. So we're still in a world where we are now in a mobile-first world. The moment is here. We've been talking about um, being you know, that this moment was gonna come for many, many, many years. The moment is here. And I would almost argue we are moving to a mobile only world. There are business trips that I will take and I will bring my laptop and I will work on it on the plane. And then I will spend, you know, two or three days in the city and I will never look at that laptop again. I will be on my phone. And I'm very, very involved in the day to day running of my business. I am on that phone all the time and not touching my laptop. If you're not thinking and you're not providing a mobile experience for me, you have completely lost me. And so, you know, we see that crossover, and this is just a pull from one of our clients' Google Analytics report, but almost every time we look at Google Analytics and run this analysis, the picture is the same. More than half of visits are coming from a mobile device. Uh, oops, did I go back? And then when you look at the conversion rates of mobile versus desktop, this is a very common theme. You see people are converting far more on desktop, they're converting far less on mobile. And Kathleen talked on this yesterday that mobile is very much a research tool where people are going back two, three, four times and researching on mobile than going back to buy on the desktop. And often they're buying desktop because your mobile experience sucks and you can't even buy on there if you wanted to. Um, but two, just think about user behavior. You're using this to research and then you're in a different moment. So um, we know from Google that 65% of decisions start on a mobile device and end somewhere else. So if you're not providing the experience for someone to easily research and learn all about your organization on a mobile device, you're gonna lose them. <clears throat> this is a very common path that we see. Someone sees an ad for a show on a mobile browses for the show on the laptop, um, adds the show to the shopping cart on a tablet, and then makes the final purchase on a PC. During, according to this study, 49% of people would buy more on a mobile if it was easy. Who here feels good about their mobile site? Okay, if you take anything home from this presentation, Invest in making your mobile e-commerce path and mobile research path easier. Um, and so we can look to the Times for innovation here. I think the Times mobile site is so amazing. Um, I think they do such a great job writing in really short, punchy headlines, lots of white space, lots of beautiful multimedia. I read the, um, you know, like I said, that, that's where I go for my news. I was happy to see a Seattle Opera ad in there when I was looking, good job team. Um, but the full page imagery, and I love this little Easter egg of motion. I was on the subway looking at this, and I saw the motion. I wouldn't read that story, it's about football, but <laughs> <laughs> I still appreciated it. 
But in such a short amount of time, how they become to be, you know, become mobile, a mobile first organization. So by the way, I was looking at this, the Times now has over a million digital subscribers. By the end of this year, they're on, on pace to have 1.5 million subscribers. So their print circulation is dropping dramatically, but they did it. Like they, you know, look, they, they looked at all the things they were doing badly and they made a plan and they're doing it. I mean, they're still working on the financial picture of it, but a million and a half people paying, people were like, no, no one's ever gonna pay for content online. They did it. So that's why we're looking at them for inspiration. So this is Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater's um, new website. And um, this was designed as a mobile first experience. And you see that um, when you're designing for a mobile experience, it's very different. Someone up here yesterday was saying, don't say click here because people aren't clicking anymore, they're, they're touching. So um, thinking about that, where somebody is in the moment they're engaging with your mobile site and designing specifically for that experience is really, really important. On the Seattle Opera site here, make it easy for me to engage on the small screen. So the programmer of this page programmed this field so my browser knows that it is an email address. So my browser is gonna display the email address. I don't have to type it in. One click, I can use this form very easily. Back to the Ailey site. Big, you know, if you're gonna be on mobile, I don't wanna pinch and zoom and use these tiny fields. I wanna have big fields that are easy for me to fill in. And this simple thing, use the same address for billing? Absolutely, I don't wanna retype a complicated address in there. So I asked who is, feels good about their mobile site. Who here has a, my whole team's gonna turn around to see the answer to this, I'm sure. Um, who here has select your own seat on their mobile? That is actually a good experience. <laughs> I mean, when we look at analytics of, of client websites, Typically when people use select your own seat, their, their average order value is higher and their conversion rate is higher because if I'm gonna plop down $200 or $100 or whatever for a pair of tickets, I wanna know where I'm sitting. How about this one? Who here has a subscription path that they're proud of on their mobile? No one. Okay, I'm gonna quote Christopher here. Don't dump me on a desktop subscription path from a Facebook ad if I'm, if I'm about to pay you $1,000, <laughs> right? I should not have a restricted experience if I'm buying a subscription. In fact, it should be the opposite. These are your most important customers. We're doing real talk this morning. I'm not sugarcoating it, and in fact, I mean, that's why I'm here. I don't wanna sugarcoat this. This is gonna be a big problem really soon if it's not already. You are probably losing customers because of your suboptimal mobile presence. You need to address this. You need to go back and you need to find a way to fund it. And you need to speak to your board and you need to speak to your executive team about becoming a mobile first organization. The time was yesterday. Okay, sorry, real talk. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, digital is about experimentation. So the Times said, unlike a printed newspaper, which is published to near perfection and launched once a day, I touched on that earlier, a digital experiment should be released quickly and refined through a cycle of continuous improvement, right? So about A-B testing and optimizing and not just launching your website every five years and then going on doing your other job and then five years later being like, oh crap, our website sucks. Um, so in the Times Innovation Report, um, they talked about this site called The Verge, and The Verge redesigned this homepage 53 times until they came to a site that was optimized and met their KPIs. So I went to my 20th, 20th, yes, 20th high school reunion in Ohio a few weeks ago. Shocking, I know. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, found one of my friends that I grew up with now works at Amazon. And as a digital marketing geek, I was like, tell me everything. Because um, he's on the operations team and he was talking about how they A-B test everything. And I've talked about this before. And he said right now they are running 43 simultaneous A-B tests on their website. Um, and I said, well, you know, tell me about one of them. And he mentioned that they just concluded, after lots of A-B testing, that men are more likely to buy shirts if it is not on a live male model. <laughs> so if you look at this, you see, can you imagine the effort now to roll out and take pictures of all the shirts again of people not on, you know, on models? So two things. One, 
Amazon is amazing. Uh, two, clearly gay men are not shopping on Amazon for, for <laughs> clothing, right? Duh. <laughs> All right. So Yosef is going to come up and talk about um, this. And he's going to talk about, oops, I went back again. OK. So we have to extend our culture of experimentation to our websites. We spend a lot of time A-B testing a lot of other things, email, social, display ads, search. But we're not A-B testing our website. We're sending people to a landing page that's the same. And if he'll talk about this a lot more, but if you improve that landing page, you're going to improve everything. So I'm going to give you a quick little preview of his presentation. Um, so we're, we've gotten into doing a lot of A-B testing on behalf of our clients. And we'll use Google Analytics data to understand what pages have the most potential for improvement. And we'll look and say, how do we think we can improve this? We'll make a test. And uh, you know, this is Wolf Trap, which is um, outside of DC. It's an outdoor performance venue. And Yosef always talks about, you know, it's a phone, right? We forget about this. It's a phone. And some people actually want to use it as a phone and call. And we saw from the analytics that less than 1% of people on the Wolf Trap mobile site were actually using it as a phone because there were no clicks, no places to actually click to call. So the A-B test was, just add a call to buy button. And the results were pretty astounding. I'm not going to tell them to you, because Yosef will. Um, so we're gonna, he's going to show you this example and a lot of other really fun A-B tests that we've run that have dramatically helped our clients' websites. OK, the next section is focusing on audience development. The idea that you, know, you just can't, can't hit publish and the reader would come was no longer working, so they actively had to find an audience. In print, you're accustomed to the fact if you make the editor's cut, you're going to find an audience, but the realization is that you have to go find your audience. You're not, they're not just going to come and read it, right? So we have to do the same. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can strengthen and segment to reach people at all points in the marketing funnel. And some of the presentations yesterday touched on this as well. So this is from the innovation report uh, of sort of the funnel of the New York Times. They wanted to turn a non-reader to a drive-by, to a repeat reader, to a registered reader, to a subscriber, to a loyalist. How? Through quality journalism. They had that quality journalism. The work was the stuff at the bottom, right? How they're connecting to their audience, that audience development piece, which they just did not have. Well, we mocked up a similar thing for the arts, where you're taking a drive-by to a single ticket buyer. You could probably add in there repeat single ticket buyer to a subscriber, to a repeat subscriber, to a donor. And you do that with quality arts programming, right? What's, what's on the stage. And then you have all of these different digital touch points in which you have to push people down. And you know, as a marketer, and with often very little staff, you have to connect with people at all points in the funnel. And that's a lot of work. So, you know, we touched on the marketing funnel yesterday. Um, you probably, if you've ever been on a phone call with me, you've probably heard me talk about the marketing funnel. Um, but, you know, from awareness to consideration uh, down to purchase or intent and then purchase, uh, Google renamed this, which I think is a really nice way of labeling these sections, which is see, think, do, care. So I wanted to show you some examples first here on social. My point of this is you need to create content for all places in the funnel and identify appropriate key performance indicators for that content. This is a Facebook Canvas ad for Lord of the Rings uh, in concert in Seattle this summer. Now, the point of this particular post was to get people excited about this concert. And the KPI was clicking through to the site to learn more about this. So this is a Canvas ad. It's a mobile-only ad unit on Facebook. And it is amazing for discovery. When people are coming to social, and this is one of the reasons I think Facebook is so powerful, you're, in a, you're looking to learn something. You're looking to discover something, right? It's not a passive experience. You want to discover on mobile. And the Canvas ads give you a great canvas to discover something, right? And so our goal here was to get people to click that learn more. And once they click the learn more, then they were much further in the funnel. And we can, from the moment that they clicked until the concert, target them with appropriate content that is about that concert. So we're going to storytell to them on Facebook 
you know, over and over until they buy tickets. And then we're gonna supplement that social media storytelling with display advertising. So wherever they go across the web, we can follow them with ads. So that is creating content, pushing people down the funnel. Does that make sense? So even within display, for example, <clears throat> you can create more top of funnel content, like this for Caramore, which is a, a festival in Westchester. So this went to, this is an acquisition effort. It's about showing that, you know, Caramore is outdoors and it's fun and it's about music. And then once someone engages, then they're gonna get show specific creative. Especially if you have something that's super obscure, unless you're hyper targeting that based on, you know, CRM data or retargeting data, it's going to be very hard to put that in front of an acquisition audience and have it do absolutely anything. So you want to sell the experience to the top of funnel people and once people have engaged further down, you can hit them uh, by more targeted ads that are specific to a performance. Same thing with video and we're gonna have a really fun panel on video later today. This is the Goodman, and this is an ad, this is a top of funnel ad. You know, I've been out here and I've said you shouldn't do talking head ads, and I sort of wanna slightly revise that. You can create slight talking head ads, but you're not gonna wanna put them as promotion on Facebook. You're gonna wanna maybe email them to your most loyal buyers or people who know your organization. But your artistic director talking about how great the season is, that is not a Facebook news feed ad unless it's hyper, hyper, hyper targeted, right? So this is an acquisition ad from the Goodman trying to get people to just, you know, it's a thumb stopper, get people to pay attention. Then there's this ad from the New York City Ballet that we showed last year at boot camp, which is about their Young Patients program. This is much longer. This requires much more engagement. It's a beautiful video, but you know, it's not a top of funnel kind of experience. This is something maybe someone who's been to the ballet a few times would see, or someone who, you know, is a subscriber or a donor of the ballet. So you have to identify the appropriate KPIs, and you can say, well, our video is not working. What does that mean? It's not selling tickets, it's not getting click through, it's not getting watched, it's identifying the KPI for the particular content. And you have to create content for all levels of that funnel, target them appropriately, and measure them appropriately. And uh, Kathleen touched on this a lot uh, yesterday. Same with search. You need to cover the funnel from awareness to you know, more of a middle funnel, which is you know, theater in Seattle, down to the bottom of the funnel, which is a specific production name. And by the way, your ads have to have the headlines of what's, and this is why search is so hard and time consuming. For someone searching theater in Seattle, you don't wanna put up you know, necessarily an ad, or let me even go higher in the funnel. If someone's searching like family activities in Seattle, you don't wanna just put an ad that says Raisin in the Sun tickets. What you want the ad to say is like, looking for something fun to do with your family? You know, consider, a, consider the theater, right? So your keywords in your ad have to tie exactly to the keywords that people are searching and that's gonna dramatically increase your click-through rate. So this is something we recently discovered. We did a um, email audit for the National Ballet of Canada and um, my colleague Ashley and I were sitting there and she actually had this awesome insight with email. So we sorted um, their emails by subject line and we looked at open rate and click-through rate. And we found that emails with price and urgency in the subject line had higher open rates and emails with content drove more traffic to the site. So think about that as you're planning your email calendar. If you can get your content earlier to people, then you can get them, you know, you send the content, send the video earlier and you make the subject line about that content and the KPI of that email is to get people to the site. Then they're a little further down the funnel. Then you can plan your next segment of emails that are more about price and promotion until they convert and you can take the people out that are converting earlier so you can give less discounts earlier on and discount more in the future. Okay. Becoming more social, I could do an entire you know, hour on this easily, but um, you know, it was, with social, it's, it's certainly not a build it and they will come scenario. So as homepage visits were declining, social media was not really picking up the slack for the Times. And their competitors like BuzzFeed, you know, the Times had maybe, what was it, like 10, 20% of their traffic on social media. BuzzFeed was like at 60%, why? because they know how to story tell on social media. They are not afraid to position their content for a social media world. And 
this, you know, they were getting clobbered. So the Huffington Post, USA Today, BuzzFeed, I mean, this is the New York Times, the paper of record was getting killed by these scrappy startups because they knew how to communicate in a digital first world. Now, this next example, many of you may recognize, I've been talking about it for a couple years, but I think it, it, it explains the importance of social media so well. Um, so this is Jacob's Pillow. You saw Greg from the Kennedy Center. I think you see his name up there. He posted this when he was at Jacob's Pillow. And um, by watching Facebook and by understanding how Facebook communicates and by doing a good job over the years of creating great content, building a following, uh, promoting posts in a very strategic way, uh, optimizing against conversion, those are all signals to Facebook that Jacob's Pillow is a very smart and good content creator and they were rewarded with more organic engagement. Now, we are in a world where organic engagement is very hard to come by. This example is a couple years old where it was a little easier. It's still really tricky, but if you pay attention, like right now, you want organic engagement, do Facebook Live, right? That's what they're trying to push. That could change tomorrow, but at this moment, Jacob's, Greg was paying attention, and Jacob's in Facebook went from serving a billion video views a day to eight billion video views a day. So as a smart content creator, what do you do? You give Facebook lots of video. This was in February. The Jacob's Pillow Festival starts in July, and June, thank you, I should know that, um, June, and um, in February, this post of, you know, this video, rehearsal room video, got it got in 90,000 Facebook news feeds, impression, 90,000 impressions, essentially for free. I mean, there was investment, obviously, in making the video and the time and then all the advertising that led up to it, but they weren't, you know, the, the festival wasn't until months later. Um, 90,000 people reached 27,000 views. And so I looked at that particular week, how many people did uh, Jacob's Pillow reach on Facebook that week? Well, they reached a million people organically. Now, the contrast is if you're, still in a, you know, a, a traditional media mindset, you can buy print ads to interrupt that many people, but even if you bought a full page ad in the New York Times, you would only reach 680,000 people. So I think this just presents such a strong contrast in how the world has changed and how you need to social storytell in order to break through. And that 680 is like down to like 550 now in terms of, so this was back when that was taken. So I'm gonna give you some tips for social storytelling. Uh, one, loosen up, right? And the Times had to do this in a big way. They were formal, they were used to their formal printed paper. They really had to loosen up in order to be successful online storytellers. So we talk a lot about the at capacity about the 70-30 rule. So 70% of your content needs to be earning attention, earning engagements, which is about giving. You have to give, 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 ask. Give, 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 ask, right? So the 70% post about giving. Um, I think yesterday Matthew was talking about it's uh, people are bored, right? What is the moment they're in when they're in a social media environment? They're bored, they want engagement, they want to discover something. You have to spend a lot of effort to provide that content to become a thumb stopper, right? You want people to stop and pay attention. You have to earn their attention. That 70% posts are hard for many organizations, and I'm gonna give you some tips about that. So I looked, and it wasn't that hard to find the absolute worst piece of social media content from an arts organization, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I covered the names to protect the innocent, um, but, this is, if you find something worse, like please send it to me. Um, but I think this is pretty god awful. And you know, there's nothing good about this. There, you know, the language preparing for the 25th anniversary season, um, it's not about the user. The image is just horrible. It's so lazy. Um, there's, you know, there's no call to action. And they were rewarded with six pity likes. So. <laughs> I mean, are you, gonna, are you gonna go to this organization, right? So my point is, you can't just go and like sit on this, you know, go into a rehearsal room, snap a picture and say, we're doing social media. That's not how it works. You need to invest in this. You need to spend money on graphic design. You need to spend money on photography. You need to spend money on video. You have to like engage someone who's a good storyteller and train them to do that. So compare that to this. Right? This is something I've been posting for a while, but I think this is one of the greatest social media posts in our industry. And this took about 20 minutes, and Lincoln Center uses this every year for Shark Week, and they probably got a ton of engagement on Facebook from it. 
So uh, showing Seattle Opera again, I think they've done an incredible evolution in a very hard space, right? Opera takes itself very seriously. To loosen up and to do stuff like this is not easy. This is a strategic move, but the amount of attention that they can now get because of this and the success of their paid social media campaigns is definitely impacted by the ability to tell stories. Look at that, one point, uh, so 14, 1,500 shares by that post. The Actors Theater of Louisville is doing a, uh, two shows right now that involve blood, and I love this. They made a cooking show with two of the actors making the blood. So, I, I mean, that is super clever. It's the, that is the opposite of like a bunch of musicians in a dark room rehearsing. So, if you look at it, we talk about this Venn diagram, and this is what I think the, the, the craft of the perfect 70% post is. What's going on in the world? What's going on in your organization? And where do they intersect? So here's a, a very simple example, right? Super easy, dug into the archive. Here's another great one. There's something called Hamilton. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's a show and it's supposed to be really good. Um, but the Lyric <laughs> Opera of Chicago connected with that, and they posted that. I love this from the New York Philharmonic. And notice none of those examples were dance examples. Um, I always go, oh, it's so easy if you're in dance. Um, but there's a dance example, right? It is easier, OK? Um, but they do a great job. They connected with um, Motivation Monday, and, and they're getting engaged. These are great 70% posts. So I encourage you to dig deep. And the, the Times learned this about evergreen content, where they had all of this amazing content. People weren't going to the homepage, but because if they're going through Google, they're going to be looking for evergreen content, content that is in the archive. So how can they leverage that? So for example, this is really blurry because it came from the Innovation Report, which is a stolen PDF. But um, <laughs> you know, they compiled all of their um, book reviews in one place, and now a ton of people go to it. I think Carnegie Hall, for example, does a great job digging into their review. You don't have to be so literal. You don't have to be showing only productions that you have on stage for the season. It's Valentine's Day, find something about love. It's the holidays, find an old show that you've done. You have these rich archives that you need to learn how to use. Same with New York City Ballet. They're slow in the summer, they're pulling archival footage. Uh, with Alvin Ailey, they actually made on their website something that really reminded me of these evergreen content pieces that the Times made. It's a history of Alvin Ailey, which is a really top search term for them, and a lot of people spend time on their site looking at the archive. Jacob's Pillow did the same thing with their Dance Interactive. So providing that content, and then you can use this for social as well. I keep talking about the New York City Ballet, but I think they, they just do video so tremendously well. And um, you, know, you spend so much time and effort investing in these videos. They're expensive. Um, you want to create evergreen video that you can use year over year. In this video that City Ballet used, created about their family series, this is the third year I've seen it. As a content creator, it's very easy to say, oh god, I'm so sick of this. Everyone's seen it. No, they haven't. Like, you're putting on your email, you're putting on social, you're putting it you know, on YouTube, put it wherever you want and use it over and over again. The amount of time you spend making it, you should be spending more time promoting it in different angles. And guess what, Facebook's, not gonna, Facebook's gonna limit your frequency anyway, so use it more than you're necessarily comfortable with because there's a large world out there. Um, same with the, the New Victory Theater has done that with Evergreen Video. Oops, I keep going backwards. Um, and then Wave Hill made this awesome inspirational video and have used it through multiple campaigns. I think this is one of the best examples of this. I literally had to look up the name of this stadium. Fenway Park. <laughs> so, serious. Um, <laughs> the Red Sox. So, um, Red Sox fans? All right. Um, but they did this awesome photo shoot in Fenway Park and every time there's a Red Sox news moment, they pull this out. And it's amazing, because Boston's such a big sports town, right? So having this content that you can use in these moments is going to help you on social. Content is king and queen, right? So we looked, and 23% of total marketing budgets for this content marketing report for the nonprofit sector, 23% of budgets were going to content marketing. We asked a very similar question in our uh, benchmarking survey. And for the arts, it is much lower. We are 
trailing behind a lot of not-for-profits in terms of investment in content marketing. This is an investment question. This is, a, this is a budgetary question. Last year, we talked about cut a print ad, create a video. You have to repurpose your budget to support this kind of marketing. It's, it's a bigger change than just saying, oh, we're going to hire one person whose half of their time is going to be spent on social. It's an investment in all those things I was talking about, video, imagery, graphic design. Um, so sidebar for Snapchat, real quick, because we're in the social section. I don't feel like we're addressing, you know, we talked a little bit about Snapchat yesterday. Just want to give a sidebar. I'm not saying Snapchat is the end all be all, but I feel like it's my responsibility to at least briefly talk about it because of its meteoric rise in the last year. Who here identifies as a Snapchat user, personally? Okay, great, about half of you. Who here has used it, uh, like geo filters for their, their uh, organization? Okay, small, like 20%. Has anyone, is anyone curating stories on the half of their organization on Snapchat? Okay, like Ryan said, I think that's a lot to ask. Um, but for those who are not using Snapchat and you're trying to speak to a millennial audience, um, there's this thing called a geo filter. And what that is, is allows you <laughs> to um, create the design and you target it by a geographical area. So you go into Snapchat and like for this conference, we've geo-targeted the time center. So if anyone's sending a snap, they can scroll across and they can pick the geo-filter and send it to their friends. And why this is amazing is it A, if you have a millennial audience, um, and let me actually step back. So millennials are the primary users of Snapchat, but we are now starting to see, I mean, by evidence of this room, people in their 30s and 40s, especially in urban environments, are embracing it. It started the same way Facebook did, right? Facebook started with younger people, and it got a little older. It started in urban markets, and then it expanded from there. Facebook, or Snapchat is growing very, very quickly. If you want a way to tell millennials you care about them and give them a way to tell their friends that they care about you, there is no better way than that Snapchat geo filter. It is very inexpensive. I think we paid maybe to get geo-filtered this entire conference in Times Square, $120, $150, something like that, very little. Um, And I'm not saying you have to do this, I just want to present it to you as an option. It's about about 200 million users of of Snapchat right now and growing very quickly. Okay, off my sidebar. On to the point of the social media section, then it was about buying media, now it's about create content, promote content, and buy media. The final section, opening up to radical change, right? Like I said, change is really hard. Humans are change resistant. And I thought the Times did an amazing job looking inward about what they were doing well and and what they were not doing well, and you're seeing the result of that now. So this is an example um, from the report that really struck me, and this reminded me of Something I hear a lot from arts organizations. Well, the marketing department's doing Facebook and you know, PR is on Twitter. And this talked about the silos that Greg talked about yesterday and how they've broken those down. Um, so does this sound familiar, right? So structure dictates success. And we're gonna talk about strategy in this last section. And when they realized the, that Facebook mattered more than Twitter, their traffic absolutely exploded. This is a strategy issue. Um, Strategy is the allocation of resources. Now this is very basic, so just bear with me. What do you have as a resource as an arts marketer? You have time and you have money, and that is it. How you allocate that time and money is going to lead to whether you're successful or whether you're not. We know from our benchmark study that 39% of arts organizations indicate that having no clear digital strategy is one of their biggest challenges to digital success. That is a, you know, that's kind of harrowing. So let's talk about strategy when it comes to social. Just look at these numbers, right? And I talked about Snapchat, and I want to underscore again, I'm not saying do Snapchat. I'm doing say, do Snapchat if it strategically makes sense for you. So the game is won and lost on Facebook. I've been saying this for years. I'm waiting one day, maybe I won't say this, but at this moment right now, you need to get good at Facebook storytelling. It is the most powerful advertising platform ever invented in the history of the world, and the ROIs, are insane, you know, 100% to 3,000%, you know, consistently on Facebook because you can get organic or engaging content to the right people and measure the success and optimize against it. It is so incredibly powerful. 
50 minutes a day is the average amount of time a user of Facebook spends across the Facebook platforms. Who here read Facebook before they got out of bed this morning? Right? Half of you. That is where your audience is. Invest more money in Facebook. Um, then, if you're doing Facebook well, think about Instagram. It has the same powerful targeting platform as Facebook. And Twitter is in a rough place right now. Their user growth is stagnating. I am not a huge Twitter user. I use it when I go to conferences. I would almost, you know, I don't see a huge value in Twitter. Maybe some of you are getting it. And again, it's not my strategy, it's yours. Measure it against your KPIs. Is it working for you? Right? Like Matthew said yesterday, it's not right or wrong, it's test it. Um, LinkedIn, much smaller universe. I don't think most arts organizations, unless you're killing it, absolutely killing it on Facebook, then you can go to LinkedIn and Pinterest or even Snapchat. But I mean, this next slide really puts it in perspective, right? This is millennials. Everyone talks about Snapchat and millennials. Well, when it comes to reach among millennials and average monthly minutes per visit, guess what? Facebook's killing it. Next time your executive director asks, why are we not on Snapchat, show them this slide. It is all about Facebook, at least for now. OK, so I want to talk about Ailey. When I started Capacity Interactive, um, I, when it was just me, uh, one of the first projects I got to work on was with Thomas Cott at Alvin Ailey. And uh, we had just, the organization just got a million dollar grant from the Doris Duke Foundation to rethink their digital. And we were thinking about how are we going to invest in social? And the first thing that we did was do a survey of the audience and understand what social networks the audience is spending their time on. And the answer was Facebook and Twitter. And we said, well, we certainly don't have the time and money to do both. So we looked deeper at the data and we saw that over 90%, I think it was 92% of the Twitter users were actually on Facebook. So we said, you know what, we're gonna go all into Facebook. And Ailey now has 623,000 likes. Um, it grew so fast with amazing content creation and a real focus on Facebook storytelling. And consistently, we will see 1,000% ROIs across this platform getting better every year. That's a strategic decision, right? We didn't say, we're going to do Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram. We just focused on Facebook. And for years, Thomas was under pressure, like, why are we not on Twitter? Why are we not on Instagram? And he said, because we don't have the support to do it well. And that is true. Now, year, a couple of years later, you know, they went into Twitter and they're now on Instagram. But actually, interesting, the Instagram philosophy is totally different for them. It's only from the dancer's perspective. So it was a very strategic maneuver. That is strategy, right? Um, I talked a lot about New York City Ballet. Karen Gertie, the marketing director, was on the boot camp stage a couple years ago talking about their video strategy. She realized the importance of video a few years ago when they were having some financial difficulties, went to their executive director and got the blessing to invest in video. And she said on the stage that they're spending over, that was two years ago, over $200,000 just on video production. Now, they're not doing all the things, and I realize you don't have, all have $200,000, but this was in a time when they were, they were in the red and they invested in it. So my point is, don't try to do all the things. Pick the thing that you are good at. Maybe that's email. Maybe it's web user experience. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's video. But one or two things and do them really well rather than trying to spread yourself too thin because you just don't have the resources to do that. So last year we talked about um, how to print out, create a video. Uh, the folks from the Ballet Met took that advice and this just made me feel really good. Um, they created a video, they invested in video and they're investing more in video. They had a board member underwrite this and they made a video and it's actually, we're gonna see it later today and it is just freaking awesome. Um, so that's a strategic maneuver to move to, you know, you just have to take a first baby step get the result, and then invest more in it. That's smart strategy. Okay, uh, you can't do it all. So the Times had to realize what skills they had. What are they good at and where do they need to improve, right? So they realized digital skills are in high demand and they had to you know, look at what the capabilities that they had and then fill in the rest. So, Arts organizations, in our benchmark report, 44% said that having not enough internal knowledge is one of the biggest challenges to digital success. You guys are here, so that is the first step. And this is why we do this conference, to help with this problem. This is why we do our capacity classroom series, to help with this problem. So this next slide I wasn't gonna show, but I decided I'm going to, because I feared that it looked self-interested. But um, here it is. So, I get asked by organizations, I need to hire a digital person. Like, what should this person do? And 
I say, well, you, obviously you can't do all the things, so you need to look at what you can do internally. And I think these things on the left, you absolutely have to own internally. Social channel management, email, and website content management. The things in the middle are things that you supplement with experts, no matter what size you are, if you think that's appropriate. Or if you're a large organization, you may have that expertise internally as well, which is analysis and strategy, graphic design, content creation in terms of video and social, and website maintenance. Now, I know very few arts organizations that have the internal expertise for this. The world is changing too quickly. These skills are way too nuanced, and a professional can just do them so much better than you could ever afford to hire internally. So that's my point of view. This is a roadmap. I hope it's valuable. OK, you need to change to succeed. So the whole point of this was to show the story institution and the evolution that they went through and how they did it. Um, there's so much more in here. If you wanted to download the report, you can, you know, it's available in PDF everywhere. Um, I love the fact that they sort of audited themselves, and I think this is something that's really useful to do, and, and it's something that we do with a number of our clients. And what we do, and this is a little hard to read because it's yellow, I apologize, but if you do a quick audit, and you can do an audit in half a day, in a few hours, or, I mean, a couple months, like, you say, here are all the things that we think we need to do. Right, and you dig into all of them. And then rank everything on a page, and then order it, value, effort, and cost. One, two, three. So everything that's low value, get rid of. Everything that's a two middle value, deprioritize it. Look at all the things that are high value, then sort them by effort and cost. And your things that are high value and low cost, nail those first, right? The first. The first three months, nail those. Then make a plan for high value, moderate cost, and high value, high cost. And that is a really nice way to approach your digital strategy. 10 takeaways. Um, OK, understanding user experience. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm just going to breeze through these. Focus on ISO, become more social, open up to radical change. We want to inspire you to go home and start a digital marketing revolution. Thank you so much.